Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to a very, very unique webinar. This particular webinar uh, obviously is about COVID-19, but atypical COVID-19 symptoms. We have on this Dr. Stanley Malamed, who I'm sure we all know. Uh, many of us have obviously seen him in his lectures on emergency medicine and dentistry. A um, whole bunch of us have probably bought a whole bunch of us have probably bought his textbook as well. Um, as the other side of the coin, we have Dr. Scott Cohen. Dr. Scott Cohen is a family practitioner. He's a CMIO of the Bassett Health System. And basically, he'll be presenting some of these sort of atypical COVID-19 symptoms. And of course, there's Dr. Malamid, who's going to talk to us about what can we expect how would we respond, and so on. So I'll turn that over to Dr. Scott. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. You can go to the next slide, Tom. We're going to talk today uh, really about a bunch of different things that are not typical for a COVID-19 lecture, you know, uh, especially not for the dental setting. We're going to talk about emergency ready readiness for coronavirus emergencies, or even coronavirus presentations, meaning someone who shows up and could potentially have COVID-19, and we don't even really realize it because of atypical presentations. We'll briefly go through what we know about coronavirus and the, the real name for it, SARS uh, coronavirus 2. We'll talk about some risk factors for, for really severe disease, but as I'm sure all of you have heard, or most of you anyway, that the risk factors for severe disease are somewhat nebulous. We're not 100% sure. Uh, there's a bunch of risk factors that are coming out now that uh, really are unexpected. Um, we'll talk about patient screening. You know, what do you do to prevent someone with coronavirus from coming in your office, you know, unexpectedly, not to discriminate against patients, but really to make sure that you're not um, infecting your staff and other patients. We'll go into, Dr. Malaman will go into personal, uh, excuse me, PPE or personal protective equipment. And I'll talk about an organ system-based approach to thinking about coronavirus in terms of its symptoms and really trying to make sure that anytime someone comes in with something, we at least think about the possibility of them having an infectious disease such as coronavirus. We'll go through some case scenarios, so Stan and I will go back and forth, and then really talk about what's next coming up in, in uh, the treatment uh, and prevention of coronavirus. And then we'll go ahead and answer uh, some questions about this. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Malaman now to talk about preparedness. Great, Scott, th great Scott, thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, yeah, you know, I'm sure that some of you who are watching this have either read my book on medical emergencies or hear me, heard me speak on medical emergencies. And, you know, uh, it's not, medical emergencies are gonna happen. Uh, unexpected things do occur. And from that perspective, it's very important, it's always been this important, that every dental office be prepared. Be prepared means having the, appro the appropriate medications, emergency drugs, the appropriate emergency equipment, having some kind of a protocol available in your office, how to handle, the, how to prevent, how to recognize, how to handle the problems, and training for the entire staff. And that last part of it, of course, gets into basic life support. And just what I wanna mention is it's not just the people in the back who treat patients, the assistant, the hygienist, and the dentist, but you should make it mandatory that every person who works in your dental office is trained in basic life support. Next slide. So having said that, and we're not gonna be discussing specifically medical emergencies, but we can talk about what the coronavirus has now done, and it's added some new threats to the dental office population or the dental office environment. Number one, the possibility of transmission of the virus from a patient to people in the staff, from staff to patients or to other people in the office. Uh, we'll talk about the asymptomatic patient, which is really going to be a difficult thing for us. The patient comes in who is healthy or appears to be healthy. And then we'll talk about the unusual uh, signs and symptoms that do occur with the coronavirus. Okay, so Scott, back to you. Okay, next slide, thank you. 
We'll briefly go through, so what is coronavirus? And here's the, the actual medical name for it, SARS uh, coronavirus 2, because it's the second strain of this novel coronavirus. Um, but, you know, we call it coronavirus disease. We call it COVID-19. There's a, a, a wide range of numbers. Just remember that coronavirus, or COVID-2, is the actual virus. COVID-19 is the disease. And the one thing I think that Stan and I want to get across is that there's a couple of, of key points. And number one is patients can have a wide variety of symptoms with coronavirus disease, or more importantly, they can have no symptoms. They can have symptoms that to us look benign, but the patient turns out to be critically ill. When you do a you know, quick exam, um, check their blood pressure, their temp, their pulse ox, whatever. So really we have to take into account that this is a very strange bug in that the presentation can be nothing to critically ill and, and all sorts of things in between. And we do know that older adults and people with underlying conditions, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, whatever, even other things, are at higher risk for developing severe complications, but there are others as well. Meaning, why is it we're seeing 32-year-old marathon runners who have absolutely no known medical illnesses who are on a ventilator and potentially die? Uh, we just don't know. And that, that's really the tough part here is it's very difficult to predict who is going to decompensate and why. Uh, and that's, I think, a struggle for medical uh, professionals in general and the whole general field of medicine, dentistry, and others, uh, because we really like to be able to predict things. And in this case, it's difficult to do. Uh, next slide. This is a very busy slide. I, I truly understand that, but I just really wanted to show very quickly on the left side here that we understand that more than likely um, this virus came from bats. Um, it actually was transmitted through contact to other live animals in a live animal market. We don't think it came from a bioterrorism lab. Uh, we're not certain about that, but it doesn't look that way based on genomic sequencing. Then, you know, that direct contact with some human um, in the live animal market in China, um, unfortunately exposed that person. And there's these re receptors that the coronavirus binds to called ACE uh, or angiotensin II uh, receptors. And then for some reason, it gained the ability to be aerosolized and transmitted extremely readily. And the one point I think we want to get out um, in this slide is human to human transition or transmission through aerosols is just incredibly easy. This is an extremely efficient virus in terms of transmission. The only virus, and it's certainly not flu, flu is not nearly as effective a transmission as this, but the only virus that's likely even close is the measles. Uh, measles is just very easily transmitted. Um, so you can see all the things on the proteins it binds to on the right, we're not gonna worry about that. Um, but the transmission is very important that it, it finally, um, when it got into humans, became aerosolized um, in terms of its transmission. And then unfortunately we've gone on from there. So next slide. Okay. So I think the one thing we also wanted to touch on is, that is really out there in society is why is COVID-19 so dangerous? Uh, well, it's dangerous mainly because of hospitalization uh, rates associated with infection, but it's also dangerous because the number of infections are high compared to the initial people who got it. So one person can infect 50 others because it's so highly transmissible. And if one in 50 people winds up going to the hospital, you can see how it exponentially grows. And places like Houston are seeing you know, massive bursts of uh, usage of their ICUs uh, and uh, hospital rooms. Uh, and it's really just it can go out of control very quickly. The other thing is, of course, unlike the flu, we know that flu vaccine is not 100% effective, but there is no vaccine yet uh, for uh, coronavirus. Coronavirus also presents oftentimes with very severe symptoms. Uh, it can present, uh, you know, we'll talk about it later, but it can present with a panoply of symptoms from head to toe. It is just a bizarre organism. Um, it also can present with somewhat unusual symptoms that you would not expect to see, and we'll go through those uh, towards the end of the talk, but very unusual symptoms that you wouldn't expect to see with this. And much more importantly than really anything else is the number of patients who are asymptomatic, who can still spread it to other people, is really high. And as Dr. Krumholtz said in that quote at the bottom, you know, COVID-10 can attack almost anything in the body with devastating consequences. And it really is a ferocious thing. It is humbling to the medical community what this can do. 
Um, just remember, there are more unknowns than knowns on coronavirus, which is why we're really struggling right now with it as a society. Next. Okay. So we talk about some of the significant risk factors for uh, coronavirus illness that is severe. It can be anything from diabetes, asthma, cancer, age, and infirmity. I think we've all heard the statistics that about 25% of deaths across the country were likely nursing home deaths, and people tend to be old and infirm. You know, male pattern baldness, we don't know. We even think that blood type may, may have something to do with it, but we just don't know. Uh, so these are all postulations. Maybe there's some causation, but we're not sure. But remember, there are plenty of examples of extremely healthy people who get really bad illness and die. Okay, next slide. And I'll pass this off to Dr. Malama now for so, um, how we can actually prevent people from coming into the office with this. Right, and, and of course, from the dental perspective, this is very important. Um, I just wanna show you on this slide that there are places you can go online and get up-to-date information. In fact, the first one, which is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, just updated their recommendations for the dental profession on the 17th of June. So these things, as, uh, as Scott said, are, are constantly in flux. They're changing literally from day to day. Uh, the ADA uh, has what is called a return to work toolkit. And I have a, an image on the right-hand side of some of the table of contents. And then the other thing is uh, you need to work with your state dental board because a lot of the recommendations that are done are done specifically through your state. And if we have anybody in Canada, through your province, but you need to work. These are the places to go to get the guidelines, uh, work with the ADA, work with your state dental board and look at the CDC recommendations. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so, this is interesting, we're you know, talking about patient screening, and on Tuesday of this week, two days ago, I was a dental patient. So, I, I went through this, and it was, it was really rather interesting. Um, the day before my appointment, uh, I got a phone call from the office, and they went through a questionnaire asking me about any fever, any sore throat, any signs or symptoms. When I arrived at the office the next day in the parking lot, I called the office to let them know I was there. Uh, when I, they went back over the questionnaire one more time, any changes in the last 24 hours. When I went in, my temperature, wearing a mask, of course, and everybody was wearing a mask when I went into the office. Um, they took my temperature immediately. Okay, and, and one of the things on the bottom of the slide, which I really wanna emphasize, and we'll discuss really the reason behind this a little bit later, is the importance of pulse oximetry. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, pulse oximetry, for those of you who uh, don't do sedation, whether it's oral sedation, uh, intravenous sedation, or even general anesthesia, pulse oximetry, it allows us to measure the saturation of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen and how well it is actually doing that. So uh, what you see here on the left side of the screen is a larger device, but on the right-hand side of the screen is something I really wanna emphasize and something that I really believe if you don't have this in your office is something well worth getting. It's a fingertip pulse oximeter. If you are at sea level and everything about you is normal, you will have a oxygen saturation between 96 and 98%. Now, when I work with sedation or general anesthesia, and we have these larger monitors that measure other vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, electrocardiogram, capnography, and things like that, there's an alarm, many alarms in there. And we have an alarm for, for these pulse ox image, pulse ox readings, pulse ox readings, and it's set for 90. So in other words, if you're normally 96 or 98%, saturation, when it gets down to 90, we, the alarm goes off and we fix the problem, whatever the problem it may be. Usually it's an airway problem. But you got to keep that in mind that 90% is getting low as we discuss some of the cases a little bit later on in this program. Mm -hmm. The other thing uh, I'm, I'm showing you here, and this comes specifically from the California Dental Association and the ADA in their uh, 
toolkit, if you will, does have a similar form, but this is the patient screening form. And what it gives you is the, the questions on the left-hand side. It gives you in the middle the, the pre-operative phone call. The next column over on the right is the one you will follow up the day of the appointment. And then on the right-hand side is the recommendations as what should be done for that patient, what should be done or what should not be done for that dental patient. When it comes to, next slide, please. I have to apologize. I'm so used to pressing a clicker <laughs> and doing this automatically. So it's, 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 uh, this is going back to the old days of the next slide in a slide tray, in a carousel tray. Uh, when it comes to the PPE, I, I find it interesting because the dental profession has really been a, a way ahead of the curve. You know, if you go back to the, the mid 1980s, when we started with gloves, masks, and glasses, okay, I mean, we're, we're, we're so comfortable with that, with that. In fact, I go, I'm one of the old school people who practiced wet finger dentistry. Uh, and, and when it came to where, and, but the fact that I worked in the operating room, I was comfortable doing this, but I cannot tell you how many of our faculty in the 1980s, the old timers, if you will, were resistant to wearing masks. I can't breathe, I'm gonna suffocate. Uh, they, wearing gloves was alien to them, you know, but we're so used to this. When I, so when I went into that office the other day, uh, the, the only thing I really saw different, that was, that was different was the face shield. The mask was there, the gowns were there, the gloves were there, nothing new, but it was that face shield. And I went in as a, as a, as a periodontal patient for root cleaning and curatage. And in fact, I told the hygienist, this is on, today's the 25th, so it's June 23rd. I told her that you were the first person other than my family to physically come into contact with me since, Mar since March 17th. I mean, that's how long this entire episode has been. But again, face masks, uh, the patient wearing the face mask while what, if they're not in the chair being treated, the staff uh, obviously wearing face masks all the time, gowns and gloves. These are the things, again, that we are happily in our profession used to doing. So it wasn't a major change for most of us who are listening to this program. Uh, so Scott talked about this. Let me just review this for you. The, um, uh, the, actually, I think this is supposed to be Scott's slide. So let's go to the next slide. And I think I'm going to throw it back to Scott right now. Yeah, so briefly about the N95 uh, personal protective equipment. And just one mention, um, our staff was asking here uh, via chat, if there are any questions, please use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of the Zoom. There is the ability to ask questions. Uh, it, you know, towards the end, when we do the Q&A function, your questions will be read aloud. So please put those in there now so that you remember them and we can actually sequence them and get them to the right person. But one thing we wanted to mention about uh, the personal protective equipment is certainly a mask and face shield is fine if you have access to N95 masks and you know, want to use those when you're aerosolizing, that's great. And even better if you have access to do true fit testing, uh, meaning someone testing to make sure it fits you correctly using the techniques that are out there, uh, that would be great. Uh, but it is certainly not mandatory, but the mask and face shield and gown obviously is. So moving on to coronavirus itself though, as we said before, there's a variety of symptoms. Some people have none, some people have a whole bunch. You know, the typical ones that you see on the screen, fever, cough, shortness of breath, headache, sore throat, you know, those are the ones that we think of, but we're gonna show you in a few minutes that there's a huge number and sometimes we just have a weird one and it turns out, oh my goodness, it turned out that was coronavirus and now because we didn't think of it and patient just showed up with a weird symptom and not all the common ones, boom. Um, now we have a huge staff exposure, you know, we have practitioners who are out, it, it, it just makes it difficult. Um, so just remember it can be any symptoms or no symptoms. And we'll, we'll have a few cases that will elucidate this and help you with the decision making about seeing a patient or excluding the patient from clinic for non-urgent treatment. Uh, next slide. Okay, so one thing I did wanna make sure we passed along was just the little things that seem to be common but not thought of as much in this disease. And one of them, and it is considered pretty much pathognomonic, if a person has a sudden loss of taste and smell, 
right now, you know, during this outbreak, you have to think of coronavirus first, period. They are coronavirus positive until proven otherwise, because it's rare that you see this on a sudden basis. Yes, people get sinusitis and other things that cause it, but for right now, this is extremely common. Also, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea seems to be one of those complex of symptoms that can show up with coronavirus. Sometimes you get rash, hives, other things, more in children than adults, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the one thing that we'll talk about in a case in a few minutes as well is this syndrome called silent hypoxia, and you'll see that in a case we talk about. But these are people who come in who look okay, but they have oxygen saturations when you check them that are not compatible with life. And these, I think, are the reason why some people just literally drop dead from this because eventually they go into congestive heart failure and they die. The other thing we'll talk about in the next slide is this Kawasaki disease-like syndrome that we see in children, this multi-system inflammatory syndrome. Um, so you'll see that. Um, next slide. So one thing, I, you know, as a family doc who does inpatient and ambulatory medicine as well, one thing that we're taught in family medicine, which is not applicable here, is that if you hear hoofbeats, think about horses, meaning think about common things. Don't think about the zebras, the uncommon things. But in this case, if you hear something that sounds weird um, or even sounds typical, like a runny nose and cough, that's not an upper respiratory infection until you prove that it's not coronavirus at this point. So normally I say, if you hear hoofbeats coming in the distance, think about a horse, not a zebra. But in this case, think about the zebras first. That's, that's really important. Um, so next slide. We're gonna talk now about the organ system-based approach to thinking about coronavirus disease. And remember, you know, family docs especially, but internists as well and other uh, physicians really like to think about diseases in more an organ system approach because it's easier to think about it, easier to remember it, easier to really package it up when you're talking to people about it. So we're gonna go through that here um, to really try to just tease it out in terms of what, it, what can be caused by coronavirus and to some extent why. Uh, so first things that you see are the constitutional and ear, nose and throat things. Clearly, you can have fever with it, but I can tell you half the people I've seen with coronavirus don't have fever. Very commonly though, extremely commonly, people say they feel like they got run over by a bus and then someone backed over them again with that bus. They have this awful body aches. Um, and they have fatigue and just, just feel awful, that general constitutional, I feel awful sort of thing. Sore throat is common, nasal congestion, runny nose, not as common this new loss to taste and smell. I'm not saying it's all that common. I'd say only 10 or 20% of people I've seen have it. Um, but the reality is if you hear that, you need to think, keep them out of the office unless it's some sort of critical emergence, emergency. Now, headaches are also very common with this. They kind of go with those constitutional-like symptoms. So someone with new headaches, not a headache person, again, I would really think long and hard about whether or not they should be tested before they should be seen for a treatment. Uh, next. So we're, let's go through the cardiovascular and pulmonary side of this because that's probably the most critical and deadly. Um, a couple things you see with the cardiovascular and pulmonary together is chest pain and shortness of breath. There's two different mechanisms for chest pain and shortness of breath in patients with coronavirus disease. One is the fact that, okay, their lungs are infected. So you get chest pain from that, short of breath because their lungs aren't efficient. But the other thing that we think is there are these phenomenon in coronavirus disease where unfortunately small uh, arterioles and arteries will just clot. And I'm not 100% sure why that is in the reading that I've done, but you'll get these microembolic events, meaning things just clot off and then the heart doesn't work well, then the lungs don't work well, and the kidneys don't work well. And you'll see in these sort of things that you can have a multitude of problems. You know, as you know, shortness of breath goes with a cough, you can have a pneumonia uh, on the chest x-ray or CT as well. And interestingly, uh, when I was reading about this a few months ago in China, uh, about how they used to diagnose in China, that is, they used CT for diagnosis. They didn't have as good a testing as we, did, as we do now. They probably do now as well. So everybody got a CT, a lot of radiation exposure, but it's really sensitive. You know, you do a CT and see a specific pattern, it's coronavirus, done. Um, we don't do that here, thankfully, for a variety of reasons. Um, but it, it does show that there's just a lot of damage that happens to the lungs uh, with people who have lung infections with coronavirus. Uh, next slide. So we talked about this before. You can have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, other GI symptoms. 
The vascular stuff I talked about, you can get chest pain from these microembolic events in the heart and lungs. You can get kidney failure from it. We're not 100% sure if a kidney failure is due to the microembolic events, or is it just that people get septic and that causes kidney failure, or the drugs that they're given? You know, we, we don't know. The other thing that was an interesting one that I first learned about a couple months ago is you can get these weird syndromes. One is called COVID toe or, or coronavirus toe. And that is a few red swollen toe, toes that are likely also microembolic events. Interestingly, uh, I have a friend whose mother who lives down in Westchester County uh, has this right now. And um, she has some vascular disease, wound up having a revast procedure a couple weeks ago. Uh, but likely this is really just coronavirus and corona toe, COVID toe that is. Uh, so it, it can be a problem. And then you see other things like the typical things that happen when pe people are on ventilators. Uh, I had one patient recently just got off a vent at 36 days, but you can have secondary bacterial infections, pneumonia, sepsis, skin breakdowns, all sorts of other things. Um, UTIs because patients are on ventilators are getting really, really sick from even just having uh, invasive treatments. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Stan to talk about, uh, you know, what, what are some of the warning signs and symptoms and all the rest, but go ahead. Right, so let's, you know, keep in mind uh, what, what Scott just talked about, but also let's talk about my perspective from, in quotes, the medical emergency. When do we stop doing our dental treatment and we worry now about the patient's life as opposed to the patient's tooth? And things such as difficulty breathing this would be a warning sign in any situation to stop what we're doing and figure out what's going on. Chest pain, or more likely a feeling of pressure, heaviness, tightness in the chest, again, is an, is an absolute reason to terminate the care or in fact not treat the patient if they're not in the chair yet. Activate emergency medical services. A patient who comes in, um, a patient of record, and you realize that mentally there's, they're not right. Is it hypoglycemia? Are they diabetic or have they not eaten? Or is it something more severe? A patient who comes in who is more drowsy, seems to be sedated, seems to be sort of not with it. And of course, the bottom one is, is cyanosis. Uh, cyanotic lips, uh, something, you, we, we work in the oral cavity. So we're used to that nice pink color of the mucous membranes. So these, these uh, warning signs on the left-hand side would be any reason if the patient is not yet in the chair to not put them in the chair, but to seek medical assistance. And obviously if that patient were in the dental chair and any of these things happened, stop what we're doing and figure out what's going on. Also keep in mind, as we heard a couple of minutes ago, that there are patients who come in who are asymptomatic. Okay, they're asymptomatic. They're healthy. I mean, as far as we know, they're an ASA1. Yeah, I think most of you out there understand the physical status classification system we've been using now since the 1970s. And an ASA1 is a perfectly healthy patient. And this patient can come into your dental office who is asymptomatic, but still be infected. And that's, this is a, a problem, obviously. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, you saw all the signs and symptoms that Scott talked about just a little while ago. And it's, it, the list is any system. I mean, and, and the things that we're talking about, the fever, the headache, these are things that everybody, everybody in the audience, I have a feeling, has had a headache, has had fever. Uh, it, it, it makes it difficult because these are very, very common signs and symptoms. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on, go to the next slide, and go through a series of cases with you. And uh, in most of these situations, these are sort of modified, but real patients. So Scott, let me go to you first and you can do the medical part of this and then I'll jump in and try to talk about the dental aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Dan. So this is a 56 year old gentleman, actually looks a little like him. Um, he's pretty healthy. He's an ex-military guy, uh, well-controlled diabetic, you know, really pretty healthy other than the diabetes. Um, he had a, an appointment uh, pre-screening and it was out, out in the parking lot. Um, and he said he had some cold-like symptoms maybe a week ago, maybe a fever a week ago. He really feels okay now. Uh, maybe a little short of breath, um, climbing stairs. But as part of the routine screening that is done for these patients, uh, he did have a pulse ox done as well as his temp. His temp screening was normal. 
but his pulse ox was 72%. And I'll give a little analogy before I turn it over to Stan. You know, I'm a pilot and you fly a 10 to 12,000 feet, which, you know, around here isn't, I'm in New York, it's not all that common since our mountains in the, the central part of New York aren't all that tall, but 10 to 12,000 feet, your sats in a normal individual, um, and some might argue whether or not I'm normal, but a normal individual, you know, will have a sat of sometimes 88 to 92 percent. That is not normal. Uh, and, you know, the part that I wanted to, to bring this up for is that you don't feel it. Uh, and so when this per person had a sat of 72, he started feeling short of breath, but you can have fairly low sats and not feel them. And that's worrisome. So Stan, what, what would you do with this guy? Right. Well, again, this is the reason I, I, I'm emphasizing the fact that you really want, if you don't have a pulse oximeter, you want to get a pulse oximeter. This is the patient who comes in who is perfectly normal looking. And again, in O2, I mentioned earlier that in the operating room, we set the alarm for a low oxygen saturation at 90. And if you can think of a, a ski slope, okay, from 100% oxygen saturation down to about 90, the ski slope is a very gradual drop. But once you get to 90%, it goes almost like a roller coaster, straight down. So 72%, you, you've got to not treat this patient. In fact, what you really need to do is 911. 911 without asking the patient, do it. And while we're waiting for 911, give this patient oxygen. Now, when the emergency uh, ambulance crew come to the office, they will then make this determination whether or not to bring this patient to the hospital. But a conscious person can refuse treatment, okay? But you don't want to be the one, the dentist, who, if you say to the patient, I'm going to call an ambulance, they may say to you, doc, I don't want you to do it. So what I'm saying to you is don't. Just make that phone call first give the patient oxygen and let the emergency crew and the patient decide on what the ultimate decision for treatment is going to be. If the patient had, it, first of all, if I got a sat of 72 in a patient, I wouldn't believe it. Okay. I mean, it, it would be almost inconceivable. You would expect to see, well, number one, they would probably be unconscious. Cyanosis would be, they would be not just a, a light blue, they'd be a navy blue in mucous membranes. So what I would do is I would, I'd do it again. I would, I would just check to make certain that the, these numbers are actually correct, but then you make that phone call for 911 and you give oxygen to the patient. No treatment, absolutely no treatment in this situation. Mm -hmm. so Stan, patient, I'm sorry, well, go ahead, if, you don't, if you didn't have a SAT of 72, so let's say you didn't have a pulse oximeter, but you knew that the patient was sick a week ago, if we didn't talk about this before, but they were sick a week ago, fever, chills, whatever, cough, and they still feel winded going upstairs, even if you didn't have a pulse ox, would you treat this person? Forget about 911 for a second. Oh, no. So, so in today's world, the answer would be no. Really? Because again, the fact that they were sick just a week ago, uh, they, it could have been just a cold, the URI, but it could not be. And, this, and it, it, we have to think about the zebra here again. We have to think about, I think actually the zebra is becoming the horse in, this, in mm -hmm. our discussion. We have to think COVID immediately. And the answer would be no. Okay, the patient is winded going upstairs. Uh, he had a cold and fever a week ago. I think this is a scenario where it, without the pulse oximeter, we would defer treatment. Now, would I call 911 in that situation? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But I would defer treatment in that situation. You might have to jump in there, Scott, because again, there's nothing other than the O2 SAD that is saying to me, you gotta call an ambulance. In other words, the winded, the, the flu-like symptoms, I might recommend that he see his medical doctor, yeah. but I'm not sure if I'm going to call 911 in, that, in the first two parts of that scenario. No, I, I would not either. Oh, I mean, obviously, I would see the person for their, their clinical illness, but if I was in that situation, I think I would do exactly what you just said, Stan. I would you know, evaluate the patient. He doesn't look sick. You, know, you don't have a pulse ox. That's okay. Uh, so I would simply just have him um, see his medical doctor, but I would not call 911 in this case either, unless I knew that the SAT was 72. And then that's right. a totally different story. And um, what I'd like you out there to do is have that pulse oximeter to find out. I mean, this is the ex perfect example of why. And it's not that expensive a device. I think it's a little over $100 right now. 
-hmm. that's during the, the that's during the pandemic it was a lot cheaper earlier but it's it's a it's a simple thing you put it out you simply put it in your finger and it gives you two readings it's going to give you your oxygen saturation and your heart rate mm -hmm. it's a really if any anytime you've gone to your physician for a physical exam they they did this it's a simple you know this is a device to go off on a tangent that has made general anesthesia so much safer mm -hmm. because we're learning instantaneously how well that patient is breathing, carrying oxygen during our cases. So again, just to reemphasize a point, pulse oximetry, go out, invest in that fingertip pulse oximeter. Okay, let's go to patient number two then, okay? All right, patient number two is a 39-year-old woman. She has no medical conditions. She had a phone screening visit, uh, so like we saw on the California Dental Association form. And that phone screening visit asked some questions and about exposures. And she said, you know, she's doing okay, but her husband has been sick with a viral syndrome, she said. You know, like runny nose, cough, low-grade fever. I don't know, Stan. Uh, what's your thoughts on this? You know, I think after this program is over, we're going to, Dennis is going to say to themselves, I'm not going to be treating anybody anymore. <laughs> uh, given the fact that, her husband is ill and has not yet been diagnosed, but has been ill with a viral syndrome. Uh, she obviously has been exposed to him. And my recommendation would be to defer treatment and to recommend strongly that both of them, the husband and wife, be, tr be, be, be uh, uh, tested and they be self-quarantined. Uh, go to the next slide. And again, on the left-hand side of this slide, you're going to see some of the questions from the California Dental Association questionnaire. But these questions do cover this. You know, they, uh, some of the questions you don't see on here that were on the, the larger form talk about have you been exposed to anybody in the last week or two who has these signs and symptoms. So best, best bet here is you defer your treatment. Again, it's routine. This is not an emergency. This is routine dental treatment. And you recommend strongly that she and her husband both be tested and that they are self-quarantined. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, next okay. slide. Next, next patient, patient here. So this gentleman is an 83-year-old male. He's pretty healthy, but he had a pre-screening and, and his daughter who, who was uh, taking care of him said, you know, he's acting a lot more tired and confused than usual, not anything specific, but he's just kind of not 100% with it. Uh, and he's just uh, very, very fatigued. Um, so in medicine, you know, this could be anything for us, but I guess thinking about the dental world now, what do you do with this guy? Do you bring him in for his appointment the next day? Do you, what, what's the recommendation? Right, well, I wanted them to put my photograph in there instead of his, but uh, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> Um, if you're looking at the picture of me up there, I could very easily fit into that photograph. Um, no treatment. Yeah, I, you know, I think as Scott mentioned earlier, the signs and symptoms that he's presenting with could be anything, respiratory problems. Uh, he could have had a CVA or other kind of you know, brain problem, uh, dementia. He's more confused than normal. Bottom line here is, there is, since the signs and symptoms are so vague, you're better off deferring the treatment. And the recommendation, of course, that he has been be seen by his primary care physician to evaluate what exactly is going on, which includes testing for COVID. Um, this was picked up at the pre phone call, the early phone call, which is, is good. If he had come into the, uh, to the office in the parking lot, you went through this again, Again, deferring treatment is the most logical thing for us to do in this situation. Scott? Yeah, as we talked about before, unfortunately in the elderly, any, any insult to their homeostasis, you know, to their balance can really cause problems. So I've seen people with heart attacks who just had a little bit of confusion or dizziness, um, UTIs, you know, urinary, urinary tract infections, sepsis, and coronavirus. So Nowadays, unfortunately, you do have to think about that. But to be honest with you, acute confusion in the elderly, even before coronavirus, I would have said, wow, you need to be seen by a medical person soon. So yes, this changes the treatment paradigm for dentistry, 
But to be honest with you, in this scenario, the patient needs medical treatment first anyway, regardless of what the cause is. So. Right. Okay, let's go to patient number four. Next slide. Next Good. So this is a woman who's 44 years old, generally healthy. Uh, she said she's actually feeling fine, but uh, she had a bad cold for about a week, maybe a month ago, sometime last month anyway. And interestingly, she said, yeah, over the past couple weeks, she's had this weird condition with a couple of her toes that are just painful and red. So of course, this makes you think, you know, does this person have coronavirus? Um, so from my perspective, and I don't know, I guess, Stan, do you have thoughts about this patient first before we go into the well, whole? Yeah, obviously, you know, the, the, the red uh, hurting toes are something that need to be seen or followed up on. But I think given the fact that this problem she had was a month ago, okay, she had, a, she had this bad cold for, for a week, a month ago, and is now fine, she is most likely asymptomatic, not asymptomatic, but she's no longer infectious. Mm -hmm. So I, I, in this situation, I would go along with the fact that following you know, the, the questionnaire, as long as everything comes up all right, the fever, her temperature is below 100.4, that treatment could be done. I, I, don't, I don't see here any, any particular situation or reason to not do the dental treatment. In fact, if we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. Um, if the patient, th these are criteria, I think it's from the CDC, when you discontinue quarantine, okay, and it's been at least seven days from the start of symptoms, we're talking about here a month ago, she is asymptomatic at this point in time, she is afebrile, okay, and um, again, one of the things that it says here on the bottom, and this is something important, again, you need to work within your state or state or city, uh, I'm in California, we have local uh, criteria, but follow the criteria established in your area. But again, in this situation, having had this one week cold a month ago, and everything else about this lady when she comes in for her treatment is okay, I would go ahead and do the dental treatment that was planned. Yeah, generally with, with it being this long since her symptoms ended, I, I would completely agree. And these criteria were initially published probably a month and a half ago you know, seven days from the start of the symptoms, meaning at least seven days uh, from the beginning of their symptoms, they have to have really a marked improvement of their symptoms. Also, at least seven, these are, these are ands, not ors, um, at least 72 hours without a fever. If they have all of those things, uh, then generally we would release them from quarantine. Although I'd say most health departments are likely saying at least 10 days of quarantine from the start of their symptoms. So just take this all with a grain of salt, that there's a fair amount of variation in how this works at the local health department level. Um, so let's go on to the next and last case here. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, this girl looks pretty good for having this illness, but so this is a 12 year old girl, no you know, medical conditions at all, very, very healthy. But uh, during the phone screening, her mom said, yeah, she's absolutely fine, but you know, she's got, bloodshot eyes over the past three or four days, and she has really extreme fatigue. And let's go to the next slide. So this is possibly at least, this Kawasaki-like syndrome or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And one of the things that we've realized just over the past month or so because of some deaths we had, including in New York, is that unfortunately Kawasaki syndrome is not, or not Kawasaki, sorry, uh, but the coronavirus like uh, Kawasaki syndrome is not as uncommon as we thought. And it's just an inflammatory syndrome. It's very similar to the vascular things that we see in adults, but more inflammation than blood clotting. And it'll affect basically any organ system. We can have people with heart problems from it, lungs, kidneys, brain, eyes, GI tract, it doesn't matter. It can be absolutely anything. They've seen it in kids that are, who are very young, up to age 21 or 22. Um, and it's, it's just one of these scary things. And as a medical person, I've diagnosed Kawasaki syndrome many times. It does present typically like this. We'll have a kid come in with fevers that are usually very high. They have swollen neck glands. They have you know what looks like pink eye or conjunctivitis amongst another, a whole bunch of other symptoms uh, like oral buccal mucosal lesions and things like that. 
Now, in this case, I would not think about Kawasaki syndrome. I would think about this coronavirus-related syndrome, uh, but they can mimic each other. And in this case, this is pathognomonic in children for coronavirus. So what I would say is in this case, I would certainly not treat this patient and they should be seen by a medical professional immediately because they can go off a cliff very quickly. Um, any comments, Stanley? Yeah, uh, I, I obviously agree with you on this because we, we, if you brought this child in, 12 year old kid, if you will, um, she's very fatigued. She's um, bloodshot eyes. I mean, if that patient came in, in any pre pandemic, I don't think we'd be treating her because there's something not right here. And, and the point would be, you know, get this child into a medical situation, have her physician evaluate her and figure out what's going on. This is absolutely so much more important in today's world as you just discussed. You know, originally with the pandemic, uh, young children, teenagers and such were in quotes immune from it. And we're finding out that that is not the case. Mm -hmm. So yes, no treatment and have them call their medical provider and have this child evaluated at that point in time. Absolutely. Kids like okay, this so get go. admitted to the hospital, yeah. period. Ah, okay. So by the way, you know, it's really important for the audience to understand that, you know, I'm a dentist, okay? And, and even though I'm supposedly, I know this stuff, you're talking to Scott, okay? He is the physician who treats these patients. Okay, so, and we have agreed, we have agreed on, on, on what we would do or not do in these patients. So, but I think coming from, from Dr. Cohen, it, it, it's really, really important to, to listen uh, to what he's saying. Okay, Thank let's you. go to the next slide then. All right, so tying in all of what we've been talking about with coronavirus disease is the fact that, you know, we were doing better with outbreaks and now unfortunately with opening up of businesses and I really think people just being frustrated with social isolation and distancing and masks. As you can see from the red on, these, on this chart here that Stan found, there's a lot of, of states that are spiking. I have family in, in Texas down in Houston who uh, wanted me to visit and I, I can't because New York State as of yesterday said, if you're going to any of these states, um, you have to isolate yourself for two weeks. And that's because the 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 bolus of cases, the burst of cases in these states is beyond worrisome. And Stan was mentioning earlier uh, to me that, you know, Houston is getting close to capacity uh, in their university hospitals uh, for ICU beds. This is a real worry. So in these areas, if you practice in any of these red states, you're not out of the woodwork. And I would really think long and hard about coronavirus. Um, so st I'm going to pass it off to Stan. What are your thoughts about like the next wave sort of thing? Right. Well, first of all, that map actually comes from yesterday. So it's, a, it's an up-to-date map. Mm -hmm. um, now, it says next wave, but th the truth is we're not out of that first wave. We're still in it. Uh, we saw some plateauing, but the more recent statistics in the United States are showing a dramatic upswing in the number of diagnosed cases, the number of hospitalizations. Not yet an increase in number of deaths, but the number of hospitalizations has gone up dramatically. So again, we're not there. We're still in the first wave. I, I think what's really going to be frightening is what happens in the fall when the traditional flu season starts. So now we're going to have the COVID virus. We're going to have the influenza virus and potentially Okay, this next wave could be disastrous. As uh, Anthony Fauci has said, you know, many, many times, the, the infectious disease guru, if you want to use that term. We have, a, we will have an influenza virus uh, vaccine. And I think, you know, I've done this every year. I'm in that age group where I, I, I need to do it. But I think when it gets to the fall and the influenza virus for this year is available, it is critically important that we all get vaccinated. Uh, I think, I think uh, Scott might mention the fact that it would help to make this diagnosis if you have the influenza vaccine and then you get ill, it's more likely than to be the COVID virus. But again, we're not there yet. And to, the, the PPE, social distancing, wearing masks, which is not a political statement, it's a, it's a safety factor are the things we need to continue doing in order to 
Well, take away, let's look at the map again. Uh, the gray, these are the states that are doing well. And if you notice on the East Coast, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, which were the red states, they were the ones that were the hot spots forever. And by closing down and doing what they were doing, look at that. Okay, but now the states that you see in red were the states that initially were not that uh, affected. Okay, Florida and, and, and Texas were, but a lot of these other states, the numbers were very low. And now take a look at that. So we've got to continue doing what we are doing in order to, well, to save everybody. Okay, mm -hmm. back to Scott. Yeah, you know, and I guess in part and parcel of that, you know, everyone thinks that immunizations when we get a vaccine is going to be a panacea. It, it will not. I mean, it's going to be a slow rollout. Even if we do get a very effective vaccine, it'll still be slow. I can tell you we're actually as, as uh, the world, you know, uh, as a whole is really doing a great job with pushing ahead on this vaccine in terms of vaccines, in terms of research, there's at least five good candidate vaccines in the US. And what we're doing is we're actually producing the vaccines, even though we don't know if they're going to work. So if they don't work, we'll have to throw them out. But if they do work, we'll be three, four, five, six months ahead of the game. So this is a really good thing. We're in phase two and three trials for a fair number of vaccines now. And the hope is that they'll be out by early next year. But we still have six, seven, eight, nine months before a vaccine is, is possibly going to be out. Um, I've heard some people say maybe by the end of the year, but it's debated. It's debatable. So we don't know. So what is the answer right now? It's, it's what Stan said. We have to do social distancing, wear face masks, not a political thing. It's just wearing face masks is protective. Um, and, and really try to do the best we can to prevent transmission. Nothing is going to be 100%, but whatever we can do to prevent that. Um, so Stan? Back to you for the next okay. slide for the dental considerations. Right, so a couple of slides on, on going back to dentistry. As I mentioned earlier, we have guidelines. Now, keep in mind also that the guidelines are literally changing day to day. But the recommendation strongly is to go to the CDC and they have, as of June 17th, which is what, eight days ago, uh, have up, updated their guidelines for the dental profession. Uh, the ADA on their website has a return to work toolkit with lots of information, recommendations, and then keep in mind that your state or local dental board does set criteria also. So these are the things, the, the information you have available in your dental office. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, essentially, as I said earlier, we've been doing a good job when it comes to protecting ourselves. Actually, the gloves, mask, and glasses going back to the 1980s was more of a self-protection kind of a thing. And now it's, it's, it goes both ways. So we have the PPEs, glove, mask, glasses. Uh, we're, cleaning, um, we're, we're, we're cleaning the chairs and the offices between patients, guidelines for that. We're doing the preoperative, the pre-appointment phone call the day before. We're monitoring our patients' temperatures when they come in. Again, 100.4 or above is a no treatment. And let me stress one more time the importance of that pulse oximeter. Okay, um, it's, it's a nice screening. You know, I'm sure that many of you on a routine basis forever have been monitoring patients' blood pressures, respiratory rates when they come into the office just as part of your physical evaluation. The pulse oximeter, a small, simple device, uh, gives you a lot of information. Keep in mind the silent hypoxia we discussed, even though you may ne never come across this, but when you see a patient coming in, let's say it's non-COVID, uh, pre-pandemic, if you will, and they have a history, let's say, of congestive heart failure, and if they come into your dental office with O2 sats running in the low 80s, it's prudent at that point in time to not treat that patient, to have them seen by their medical doctor to figure out what's going on and to treat it. So again, our profession, uh, oh, by the way, one thing I want to mention about the pulse oximeter is in between uses, it needs to be decontaminated, needs to be cleaned because you're putting it onto a patient's fingertip. So that's one more item that we need to make sure that is cleaned or decontaminated between our patient treatment. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And I think it's time, uh, if any, anybody out there does have any questions for Scott or I, uh, let's do it. Absolutely. 
Don? I'm there. So okay. we have a, a whole series of questions, but interestingly enough, Dr. Malamud um, made sure that we answered a whole bunch of them just over about the last two minutes. So among those questions, obviously, were what's the, the temperature that we would look to as a stopping point on a thermometer? And that has been established uh, by, by CDC and, uh, and the ADA as 100.4 or above. And, and then I'll throw one at, at Dr. Scott Cohen, and that is, because this came in, what type of thermometer would be appropriate? Yeah, long answer, uh, but I'll try to shorten it. Um, suffice it to say, it's whatever you can get your hands on that is usable quickly uh, to take care of patients, preferably no touch, but if it is touch, it has to be sanitizable, if that's a word, um, and or have a disposable cover. Uh, there is uh, ample evidence that some thermometers work better than others. I can't tell you which or what because it varies based on the, um, the brand and everything, but the temporal thermometers, the ones that are rubbed across the temple, uh, the laser thermometers, the no touch, they work really well. And I would just use that threshold at 100.4. That being said, you know, Stan mentioned something to me yesterday. You have somebody who's in Palm Springs or is in the desert somewhere, and you know they're out in 110 degree heat in Phoenix. You know, and they come in your office and they've got a temp 101. Okay, it's skin temperature when you're using the no touch. So have them just sit down in the shade for three minutes, or sit down in their car for you know 10 minutes and recheck it. Because honestly, if it's 101 and you recheck it three minutes later and it's normal when they get in a cool spot, it was just because their skin was hot because it's, it's hot outside. Thank you. Um, another question on that, and, and this one would be again for Dr. Malamed, what's the lowest pulse ox reading you would still accept the patient for treatment? Okay, so I've mentioned a number of times that we do set the alarm for 90%. However, a uh, patient comes into your dental office and it has to, it'll be a new patient, okay? And if they have a history, if I saw O2 sats running in the low 90s, I would, I, would, I would probably defer treatment and try to figure out why the O2 sat is that low. Couple of things, uh, again, 95, 96. If you live in Denver, Colorado, you're at 5,000 feet, you're gonna see lower numbers than 95, 90, 96 or 98. Mexico City is even higher, O2 sats go down, they're lower. But 90 is a number below which we stop and we take care of the problem. Uh, I would say, Low 90s, I would say low 90s as a starting O2 sat. Now, one thing to keep in mind also is that the patient has nail polish on, it can affect the O2 sat. And normally, I mean, if you can see my finger, the device is clipped onto the finger, so it's over the fingernail. And in times with nail polish, for example, it, it may affect the reading if you simply take the device and put it on sideways, not covering the nail, but you put it on on either side of the nail, and you can get a good reading. But I would say low 90s would be a point at which I would be concerned enough to want to stop or not do the treatment and figure out why the number is that low. Scott? Yeah, from the medical perspective, anything under 94 really, I mean, some people even say 95, but anything under 94 needs to be evaluated in terms of why. Whether or not you treat, risk of decomp decompensating during the treatment is another issue but certainly needs evaluation. Right, you have to also keep in mind, Scott, that we are working in the airway. You know, the dentist mm -hmm. is always, everything that we're doing is trying to obstruct an airway. Luckily, with a person who is fully conscious, with musculature that works, we don't win. We, we, you know, the patient survives. But if they come in with that low number, 94, 93, 92, and we don't know the reason behind it, and we are working in the airway, and let's say the patient, uh, is a mouth breather, doesn't breathe through their nose. So the, the, it's very, very possible that that 94 starting number could go way down. So I, I, I'm with you, I would say low 90s would be a point at which we would defer treatment and recommend they see their physician to figure out why this is happening. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Scott, um, an interesting question, and <clears throat> it was, 
is the pulse oximeter a better indicator of an infectious COVID patient than taking a temperature? Um, it's a hard question to answer. I can, the best thing I can tell you is that in routine screening that is done in large settings like airports, um, big workplaces, you don't really have the time to do pulse oximetry. So the best quick screening is a symptom screen and a uh, temperature. That being said, if you can add a pulse ox to it, it just adds some degree of extra. But if I had a choice where I had only one piece of equipment to screen people, I'd probably prefer a, thermo a good thermometer and the screening tool. And, and Dr. Malaman, do you use a pulse oximeter for every patient? I would, okay, pre-pandemic, no. But if you have a, see, I would say right now that most dentists out there do not have pulse oximeters. Uh, it, it's a fact because you know, if you're doing sedation uh, in a state where you need to have a permit to do oral sedation or IV or GA, you have pulse oximeters. It's part of what we do. And for those of us who have been doing it, we, don't, we wouldn't even touch a patient anymore without having a pulse oximeter. So the answer is we did not prior to the pandemic, but because of what is happening right now, I would screen every patient with a pulse ox similar. Again, the, the temperature and the pulse ox, as Scott said, along with the questionnaire are the things we, we should be doing. But the answer is we didn't in the past. I would recommend strongly from this point on, it's such a simple thing to do to start doing it and record these. Uh, obviously, you make a record of what you're doing. You record the numbers. So going along with that, there are many pulse oximeters out there in all price ranges. Do you recommend any particular ones? And while you're at that, how do you disinfect the pulse oximeter after each use? Okay. Yeah, okay, you you, Scott, one, well, let me just, before you do that, um, I, I, want, I, I can't recommend any one particular one. I really can't. Um, but I, again, I, I think for most dental offices out there, who are not doing the sedation, as I'm mentioning before, the fingertip is the way to go, as opposed mm -hmm. to buying a vital signs monitor, which is a more complicated device, more expensive device that records blood pressure, heart rate, electrocardiogram, and other things. So the fingertip is the way to go. And I'm gonna, let me throw it to Dr. Cohen to talk about maybe more specifics on that. Yeah, I can, I can tell you from experience personally, um, I sent a lot of people home with pulse oximeters who had COVID. So they could follow them. They follow themselves. I've dropped them off myself on people's porches uh, when they were quarantined. Um, the, there's one, and I've used them myself, both in flight and at home. And I can tell you that you're better off buying one from a reputable medical establishment, whoever that is. And the reason that is, I've had experience with the ones that came in from China. You know, boatload, 15, 18 bucks, whatever they were. Now they're probably up to 40, even for the real, real cheap ones. They're cheap and they don't track well. It's hard to get a reading on them. They read 60% and then you freak out. Um, so I really encourage people to buy them from a reputable medical dealer. Uh, just be, and this isn't, you know, I don't work for Health First. This isn't me, you know, representing them. I'm just saying that I found that if you get the real medical ones, you're more likely to get a quick and accurate answer than if you buy one of the real cheap ones from China, which I have one of them in my drawer um, that I have to shake when I'm gonna use it in the airplane too. So um, just be aware that there's an, a risk with that. And, and with that, one of the questions, um, would I look for like an FDA approved label on say the thermometers and the pulse oximeters? I, I don't know that there are FDA labels on there, Scott. No. Yeah, I don't think the FDA does that. They don't approve these devices. As far as I know, I've never seen it. Okay, but again, reputable, reputable. That's the important thing. Um, my experience was early in the pandemic, we ordered some uh, of the infrared thermometers from China and neither one of them worked. That we had to re return them. They were just defective. They didn't work at all. Never worked, in fact. So reputable is the way to go. And I don't think the FDA does approve uh, 
these specific devices. And, and how would we disinfect uh, a pulse oximeter? That's a good question. <laughs> Which yeah, I so, don't think I have. I don't think I have the right answer for that. Does Scott have an answer for that? How would you yes, disinfect the pulse so oximeter? The the best thing to disinfect them with is the virucidal wipes. Um, that can be things like not to use name brands, but Oxivir and things like that. Um, so any of the uh, the the wipes that are virucidal, although obviously all of them are bactericidal and fungicidal as well, and and TB. Um, but you want to use those. But the one thing I can tell people to be extremely careful about is to read the dwell time. By dwell time, I mean, how long does the device have to be wet with the material you're cleaning it with in order for the bug to be killed? Because sometimes it's as long as two or three minutes. Uh, that's a long time. We think, oh, you wipe it off, you're good. That's not the case. So make sure you pay attention, read the labels to see what the dwell times are. But any of our typical disinfectant wipes, just read them, they'll say they're virucidal. Right, and I think that everybody has jars of these in your house or office right now. We, we, we've gotten used to using it, but you're right. I mean, that thing about the, how long you need to have it wet is very important. Most of us always thought you wipe it on, you wipe it off and you're okay. But in the last several months, we've been learning that that's not the case. You need to keep it in contact. And each of these jars or bottles will give you the amount of time they recommend to be in contact with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, another interesting question for both of you, is there any data on cases involving the dental profession, hygienists, dentists, dental assistants? I know of three uh, right down the street for me. So I'd say yes, but I don't know the national or state data on that. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen national or state data, but uh, it, uh, it makes sense that it's gonna happen because of number one, look at the aerosols involved in what we do. You know, cutting mm -hmm. with a, with a high-speed handpiece with water, uh, um, the ultrasonic scalers, and, and I was listening to one of Dr. Christensen, Gordon Christensen's uh, programs not too long ago. The ultrasonic cleaner that we have in the office is one of the most likely contaminants, if you will, with aerosol. And once that aerosol is in the air, I think it, we talked about this, Scott, it takes almost two hours for the aerosol to be totally dissipated to, to land on the surface. <laughs> so that's a hell of a long time. So we're in a profession where we do cause a lot of this aerosol. And that's why the protective, the PPEs becomes critically important for all of us. Right. A very interesting question came up and, and I'll read it directly. I had a paramedic scheduled yesterday for hygiene. He did three transports the prior day of COVID positive patients. Should he have to be rescheduled? Okay. Yeah. From the dentist perspective first, I'm saying yes. What do you I, say, Scott? I would not. Um, you would not I, want. I think this is the first time we've uh, dif differed on our, our answers here. So there's a couple of different things here. Number one is I would ask a question. Were you wearing personal protective equipment? Were you wearing an N95 mask, a face shield, and a gown? If the answer is yes, um, then I clearly would say no. If the answer was no, I still would probably say no that they they uh, that they didn't need to be deferred. But the best answer is to probably say, "All right, great. You you had an unprotected exposure. Just defer the treatment. That's the just the the safest way to go about it." But you have to think too, what's the likelihood of them being contagious one day after being exposed to someone? It takes a fair amount longer than that for them to become contagious. But I still, I concur with you that in that case, I would defer if the paramedic did not use personal protective equipment. Yeah, because I mean, EMTs, it's not a matter of, isn't it almost in some areas, it's an everyday thing. It's not a, it's right. not who's yesterday. And yeah. there's, I'm sure there are places on that map we looked at uh, up in North, South Dakota, for example, where they may, the EMTs and paramedics may not come across a, a COVID patient for a while. Yeah. But there are places like where, you know, New York City, where it's a daily thing. And I tell you, that's a big criteria right there. Mm -hmm. A New yeah, York so City paramedic coming in, I would, I would be more inclined to back off on in that situation. Mm -hmm. 
unless it was emergency treatment, which we're not t- discussing right now. Mm-hmm. But for routine treatment, you can always, it's called elective care for that reason. You yeah. can elect not to do it. The other side of that coin, of course, is now you have a patient, say you have a nurse on the ICU, so now you're not going to see them for a year or two, you know, because they're taking no, you're care right. of patients. So uh, we can go back and forth on that all day. But, that, right? but it is tough. That is, that's, yeah. I mean, those first responders, how about the people who work in a grocery store, you know, the, yeah. who've been there the entire time? You're right. This, this population of people we're more concerned about is, is large. It's not just certain people. It's people who have been working the, the last three months in these high exposure environments. It, yeah. it is. It's a, you know, a lot of it is a personal decision. It's how do you feel? I mean, there are you know, people out there now who are going into the bars and whatever without social distancing. And if that's your dental office, you might be comfortable doing that. Mm-hmm. But I would, I, I'm, I'm on the other side of that coin. I want to protect myself. I want to protect my staff. I want to protect my patients. And I would be more inclined to be, use the word conservative and maybe not treating some of these people if there was doubt in my mind. Yeah. And that's my two, personal feeling. There's two other provisos here. One is there is certainly an option to have that patient tested before you see them. And that's what a lot of university based dental uh, groups are doing. Um, and that is because they have the capacity to do that within their facilities. So just test the patient and, you know, do it when the test comes back, usually no more than 96 hours before they're going to be seen. The other thing that you have to think about in this setting regarding healthcare workers is if you look at the endemic rates of COVID disease in healthcare workers versus the general population, who has a lower rate? It's healthcare workers. And the reason for that is that we protect ourselves. PPE, right. Right, exactly. So think of, just right. think about that as well when you make your decision. Right. On how to, how right. to go like forward. I said, we've been ahead of the curve in dentistry with, with PPE mm-hmm. for a long time. Yep. And you're right. I mean, you, you know those three cases down the street from you, but within our dental profession, uh, we haven't heard either from the ADA of any outbreaks, if you want to call it, hot spots that occurred because of a dental office. Mm-hmm. which is good yeah so an, an interesting couple of questions involving hypochlorous acid one is Say it, it again good, what hypochlorous acid is it a, a good tool to use to spray in the air and is it something we should conceivably use to disinfect our pulse oximeter no, that's bleach right hypochloric acid no no what no. It, it's a, a, a compound that I think the original work came out of Europe. And it's becoming more interesting at this point. Why don't, why don't we table that if you guys aren't ready, and we will publish that after. Sounds okay, good. Because I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Nor am I. Well, since I'm on the board at OSAP, I think I can get some good answers for for our our people on that. Let's move on. Here's an interesting situation. Um, Dr. Scott, we have a mobile dental clinic program. We see children kindergarten to fifth grade. Should we use the pulse oximeter and are the pulse oximeter numbers the same for children? You certainly can use the pulse oximeter um, for children. I don't think there's any harm in it. There's probably not as much utility in it as children rarely get the horrible respiratory disease that you see in adults. Uh, But it's certainly not an unreasonable thing to do. The numbers are the same in children as they are in adults, though. Correct. You know, if you have it, Don, if you have it, use it. Mm -hmm. There you go. You never know what you're going to find. Uh, yes. You might find something totally unrelated to this that is significant also. It's also a pulse oximeter, so it's very easy with those devices to pick up cardiac dysrhythmias, irregular heartbeats. Mm-hmm. So it has we've a lot got, of utility. You've got a question on that coming up too, but first, pollen counts in the Northwest have been unusually high this spring. Can COVID appearing toes also be caused by pollen allergies? Are they similar in appearance to chillblains or Raynaud's? No, um, 
so first of all, pollen can't cause a COVID toe-like syndrome. Um, when people get things like Raynaud's phenomenon or chill veins, they're very different. Those are transient um, for the most part. And if they're not, it's a big problem. Uh, the COVID toe, you know, you have a few toes that are red and they stay red days, weeks. Um, whereas with some of the other things, it's not, uh, it's a, it's not a transient thing. Cool. Here's a, here's one for you, Dr. Scott. Should we be concerned about lasting cardiac or other organ damage in people that have been hospitalized with COVID-19? Should we consider medical consult before dental treatment? There is a fair amount of concern about patients who have gone through very significant coronavirus disease, specifically the respiratory disease. Not as much cardiac, but respiratory. So patients have severe um, ARDS, uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome, that causes very significant damage to the lungs. So what I would use as criteria is, is the patient back to normal? Meaning, can they walk upstairs? Can they do all the other things they normally could do? Or are they like my patient who is on a vent for 36 days? You know, is he still wearing oxygen and things like that? If he, the person is still wearing oxygen and still, you know, struggling to walk upstairs, I would certainly get a medical consult. But if they say they're completely back to normal, I can walk five miles now, I can walk upstairs without getting short of breath, then no, I, I would not recommend that. Right. And remember, we, we t I mentioned earlier the physical status classification system that most of us have been using in our, in our dental practices. And one of the criteria is the ability to walk up a flight of stairs. Uh, the ASA1 patient, normal healthy patient, can walk up that flight of stairs and just keep going with no, no, no distress. ASA2 has to stop en route because of shortness of breath or chest pain or fatigue. ASA3, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the ASA2 makes it up the flight of stairs without stopping, but stops at the top of the stairs because of mm -hmm. chest pain, shortness of breath. ASA3 has to stop en route because of distress. So we, we've been using that system, if, if you along with other criteria, but that flight of stairs has been around in anesthesiology for since the late 1940s. Mm -hmm. So you're right, this, this staircase thing is, is quite, quite important. Mm -hmm. Yep. So <clears throat> here's one for you, Dr. Malamud. Why should we even be doing preventative treatment like Profi at this point? Well, I don't think there's any reason not to. Very simple. I mean, do you want to, whoever wrote that question, then, so you're going to close down your office and not do anything for whatever number of months until you're comfortable doing it. Uh, and that's one way to go. I mean, uh, there are people, I mean, look, I'm, I'm very reluctant still to go into any environment where there are crowds. Uh, I won't go to a movie theater. I'm not going to, I just canceled my football tickets for this year. You know, that's my personal thing. And, and, but the evidence is, there's been no evidence that the dental office is one of those hotspots for spreading the COVID virus. So again, it, it's a personal thing that you have to decide for yourself. But the reason that dental offices are now being allowed to open for routine treatment is because there is no evidence that we are the hotspots again who are spreading it, but we are taking care we're taking more care than we normally would, which was still a lot of care, to minimize the risk to us and to our patients. So there's the reason right there. I mean, people need dental work. I had my root planning and curatage. Do I need to do it? Well, it's been six months since my last time. And I, personally, that I was very uncomfortable with that, with not having been to the dentist in a while. And I did not feel uncomfortable going. Okay, I felt they did the best they could. They did well. They evaluated me. There was no other patient in the office while I was there. Okay. So yeah, it's a, it's a personal decision, but there's no reason not to, unless you personally are very uncomfortable with opening up again at this point in time. So there was a, a bit of a follow-up question on that, and it had to do with the necessity for doing that recall visit, that profi. Um, and the value versus the risk. Yeah, but that was my decision. You know, uh, I got a phone call from my dentist's office 
and it was about three weeks ago, and they said we're now open for routine treatment. And I made the decision, yes, I want to go. I could have easily made the decision, I'm uncomfortable. You know, if I got a phone call today saying that uh, my local AMC movie theater is open, I would say, you know what, thank you, but I would be uncomfortable going. So risk versus benefit, right. And I, as the, as the patient, okay, I made that decision that the benefit of my going to having my normal every three month root planning and curatage outweighed the risk. Cause I, I, I personally felt that the risk was minimal in that situation. I'll let you know in a couple of weeks, by the way, if that's true. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> do we know if a patient is still contagious if they're in the later stages of the disease, i.e. with persistent respiratory issues after three weeks? Mm -hmm. the, the likelihood of someone having, uh, still being infectious three weeks after having COVID is extremely low. Uh, patients who have coronavirus related lung problems, you know, cough, pneumonia, things like that, they'll cough for weeks if not months. So I would say at that point, I would not worry about them being infectious as long as they meet the criteria we talked about, which is you know, at least seven days from the start of symptoms, at least three days with no fever and a marked improvement in their symptoms. Okay, a couple of um, interesting questions may not be to point, um, but they certainly could be very temporal uh, with regard to our country today. Do you anticipate states will suspend non-emergency dental treatment in the fall? And I'm gonna to add to that, or maybe soon. Hmm. You know, judging by some of the charts that I've seen where the United States compared to other countries, where their curve is down, our curve is going up, it, it, it's possible. I, I think maybe it's possible in certain states. If you go back to the map, I think you see in, fr in front of you, in some of these states where um, you see the tremendous increases, they are beginning to close down. Uh, Texas, I th again, I'm just, I read this this morning, but I, I can't give the uh, specifics. They are closing down things that they had reopened. Again, this goes against what the public wants. In some cases, what the the, the, polit the government of that, that, that state wants, but we are seeing tremendous upsurges in certain areas. Again, it would be location specific, I think, as to what, is, what stays open and what might be closed down again. Scott? Yeah, I completely agree. It's going to be highly variable, you know, based on where you are, where we are in the stages of, of disease. If you're in a state, you know, on this, this map, which I really like, which is in the gray, tan or whatever, they're not going to, you know, close down um, preventative treatments, but you know, in a, in progressive states that you know really are following this closely, if they start seeing significant rises, there's a whole bunch of things uh, that are going to start closing down again. Right. Absolutely. And I think more and more of it gets to the fact that you need to have people out there in the street with their masks on and social distancing. Right. Yep. Two more key questions. Um, one of my combined a couple, um, can you use, can a patient have gloves on or can you use a plastic sheet with a pulse oximeter? No. I wouldn't think so. If nail polish can affect a pulse oximeter, I think putting a layer of whatever, not latex, but rubber between it might affect it. I don't know for a fact because our patients in the OR and being sedated patients don't wear gloves, so I, I don't really have that experience. But Scott, you said no? No, most of the gloves that we have are not fully transparent. If they're not fully transparent, they cannot be used. Uh, okay. And I, I even doubt that regular transparent gloves, which is a few brands out there, uh, would work for this, for that, so okay. no. Um, so my question to anybody out there, who has a pulse oximeter, try it and then let us know. Yeah. Okay. Let us know. I, I, it's, it'd be worth trying it and uh, be information for us for the future. But why would your patient be wearing gloves? That's a question. Yeah. Why have your patient wearing gloves during treatment? 
They, uh, they oftentimes do. I did have a patient come in last week wearing some electrician's gloves or fuzzy gloves. Doesn't protect them. I was on the phone with my father earlier today and went to get a cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts and there's a guy sitting out there um, eating and drinking with gloves on, but he had ripped the tips off of the fingers. Um, and they were the purple gloves. I'm not sure how even using gloves was helpful, much less ripping off the, the fingers. Right. So there's all these misconceptions out there that right. gloves are helpful. They are not. I tell people don't wear them because it fools you into thinking you can do everything. So just sanitize your hands frequently. Exactly. I've washed my hands more in the last three months. I think they did in the last 15 years. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's but good... you know what? It's the new normal. You get That's used good. to it. Yep. What's the best way, uh, and it's a pretty good question because this is going to come around. What's the best way to explain to patients why we're screening for an O2 level? Well, from my perspective, and um, Scott will go on to this, I guess, a little more, is that since this is a respiratory problem, the lungs are affected terribly in this situation. Uh, the oxygen saturation level is a very important number. It's basically telling us how well your lungs are functioning to give oxygen to your blood that carries that blood to the cells in your body. So putting it into English, I'm not sure how I would say it, but that's basically it. It's telling us how well your blood is carrying oxygen, which is essential for life. Yeah, we can roll reverse here a little bit. Um, I would say, honestly, because we care about uh, you as a person and your general health, not just your teeth. And we just want to make sure that you're healthy. And unfortunately, coronavirus disease can cause very low oxygen levels with people even feeling fairly normal. And we just are doing this as a service to our patients. You know, when I started at USC, I started teaching in 1973, coming out of an anesthesiology residency. I had USC Dental School Institute monitoring blood pressure on all patients. It had not been done. And the feedback from the, 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 the what's, what's the negative word is, the uh, counter from a lot of the faculty at that time who were dentists who were not used to doing it, what do we think we're physicians? Why are we doing this? You know, and never ever did a patient say that. You know, why are you doing this? They all were appreciative of it. And now it's standard. I mean, it, it is part of the standard of care of a preoperative evaluation of all of our patients. You know, you get used to it. And I'm, I'm hoping that this pulse oximetry does become much more, much more frequently used. You go to your physician's office, and one of the things that is done routinely by the physician's assistant, the thing that bothers me the most in my physical exam is getting on the damn scale, but that's besides the point. They take your blood pressure, they put the little fingertip pulse oximeter on. It's part of an evaluation. It's giving them very important information about your heart and your lungs. Cool. What can you advise us about controlling airflow in the office? Mm. <laughs> Let me take uh, that one. Uh, you know, the answer, I can't really give you a good answer, but, mm. but, but, but. You know, in the operating room, we have laminar airflow. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we have these anesthetic gases that are potentially toxic to the people who breathe it in, not just not the patient, but those who work around it chronically. So what happens is air from, flows in from the ceiling, is sucked out on the floor, and you're not rebreathing air. Um, that would be hard to do in a dental office. The, the expense, of course, would be crazy. And is it necessary? You know, uh, when it comes to another thing I deal with is teaching nitrous oxide oxygen, inhalation sedation. And yes, we are now using scavenging masks to limit it, to, to minimize our exposure to nitrous oxide. Uh, some doctors put a fan in the office and the mm -hmm. fan is blowing across the patient's face out the door. In other words, to minimize our exposure. But I, I, I don't know what, what we actually can do, if anything. Uh, in the way of the airflow in a dental environment. That's something I'm not really, I can't give you. The, the only thing that we do know is increasing airflow. And by airflow, I don't mean a fan facing out into a hallway where you're, you know, blowing that stuff towards other people. What I, what I mean is the number of cycles 
of air coming through the, the office. So uh, because, you know, you put a pleated filter in your return system, HEPA filtration, um, that does likely decrease the amount of time that these particles are suspended in the air. Um, but that means, you know, having higher capacity fans, putting negative pressure in, which negative pressure, you know, in the medical sense is having a whole system that, you know, keeps the room negative and sucks air out of ceiling. But negative pressure could be as simple as putting a fan in that room and having that fan blow out. Um, you know, anything that increases the, the flow of air in and out of a room, preferably either vented out or through filtration uh, will help. It's a very expensive proposition to do a formal thing. Mm -hmm. So again, risk versus risk versus benefit in that situation. I don't think the I don't think the benefit right is going to be that great. So yeah, one of our attendees um, responded on the gloves. I have a no glove policy for patients. I don't know where their gloves have been. I actually have all patients wash their hands, rinse, spit then go back. That way, I know all hands are clean as patients touch our property. If elderly feel better in gloves, they still wash their hands. I'll give them a new set of gloves. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Yeah, very sounds reasonable. Good. Yeah. Another one. What is the effect of a tight-fitting N95 on the dentist O2 sac? You know, let me, when we started wearing gloves, masks, and glasses back in the 80s, I, I mentioned how a lot of the faculty, I can't breathe with this mask on. This is not an N95, it's a typical operating room mask. So I said to this doctor, look at the Los Angeles Times obituary column and see how many anesthesiologists, operating room personnel died from suffocation yesterday. <laughs> the answer is, of course not. You know, it's something you need. Breathing with a mask on is different, you know, but you get used to it, okay? It, it's not that difficult to do. And I, I, again, I can't speak to the N95, but keep in mind that all of those first responders, all the people who work in the ER in hospitals are wearing N95s and they are not dying from suffocation. Scott? N95 masks do not significantly reduce um, in healthy people anyway, do not significantly reduce your pulse oximetry. They are quite porous. They do require a slight amount more of respiratory effort, but they don't necessarily reduce your, your pulse oximetry or increase your, uh, your CO2 um, and cause so-called hypercarbia. Yeah. So a question comes up, um, somebody who has deferred um, seeing children initially, and they plan to start seeing children over six years. What about concerns for younger children? Uh, I don't know why that, why that would be a case. Why, what's the difference between six years old and three years old? You know, if you're comfortable treating children in general, or if you're a pediatric dentist, I don't think there's a reason because of the COVID uh, pandemic to not treat these patients. Mm -hmm. Scott? Agreed. I, I don't really see the difference. Um, you know, there's a risk of them having the, the weird coronavirus presentation if they get it, but it's just questions you ask and you look at the, look at the kid and make sure they look well. Um, but no, I would have no restrictions as long as you're, as long as you're open up to take care of other patients. Yeah. I had an interesting question here, which um, Dr. Scott, this is in your range. Do you have any concerns about the health risks to providers from wearing N95 respirators and level three masks? Some of these masks have strong chemical odors with a question mark. Yeah, you know, they've worried about that with some of the masks that just have some weird odor. I think it's a solvent. Um, hopefully it's not formaldehyde or something. I tell people just try to stick with the masks that don't have that odor, the, the, um, the procedural masks, um, because we just don't know what's, what's coming out of those, unfortunately. But I have not heard, uh, again, as Stan said, you know, we don't know of any deaths in the, you know, the times uh, from, you know, anesthesiologists who are exposed to masks for 
years or surgeons or, or now dentists since the 80s. Um, so I, I'm not too worried about that, to be perfectly honest with you. But I've had a couple where I, they just, it smells awful. Um, and I've, I've decided to switch masks. So a final question, and this one sits in many, many, many providers' heads, and that is, what about charging a COVID-19 slash PPE charge? You know, I don't even want to address that. Uh, that's, you know, that's, <laughs> I really, I, I, no, uh, I would feel uncomfortable with that. I really would. You know, I, if you have a specific charge to me would be bothersome. But again, I don't practice. I don't, I no longer practice. Okay. And, and I would just think I'd be uncomfortable doing that, but I don't think there would be a problem if you did. But I, again, it's a, a question to me is a little bit bothersome. So I, I, I can't give you a good answer. Scott, what do you believe? What do you think? The answer in the medical world is a lot easier than that. It's, I can charge I can charge to paint the walls white. Um, I'll never get reimbursed for it. So we don't even bother having those discussions. Right. Uh, the dental world is still very different. Fee for service, you know, usual customary. Um, so I wouldn't even be able to comment on that since it's not in my realm of thinking. Yep. So I, I, I'm in um, at, at, as uh, the same range of practice as Dr. Malamed. <clears throat> this question is Dr. Malamed. If you'll think about it, came up in the 80s. And the question that would come up is, what would happen if the patient said, I'm not going to pay that charge? What would you do? Eat it. <laughs> and if you're charging for it, look, way back when, I have to go back to things I'm comfortable with. When we started doing nitrous oxide oxygen, sedation at USC, uh, there was a charge for it. Now we're using sedation on person who needs it because without sedation, they make our job much more difficult. They're tough patients to treat. And when a patient couldn't afford it, we ate it, we did it, we did it. Okay, and I, I, I would think the same, I, I'm just saying, I would think that if you're charging for PPE, uh, what are you gonna do? You're not gonna treat the patient if, that's, if, you, if you're gonna go to that route which means I don't get into money here, but by not treating a patient, you are not getting an income from them. And how much are you losing? What would be your PPE charge? I, I have no idea what that might be. I would treat the patient. I, I'm a firm believer in treating people. Uh, and if these, some of these patients can't afford some of the things that we wanna do, uh, depending upon the charge, which can't be that much with my nitrous back then or PPE now, I would do it. I don't know. Uh, that's that's my response. Thank you, Dr. Malamud, and and thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, please, for anybody who still has more questions, please.